Hello, my name is Flat Earth Runner, and you're listening to Catholic versus Protestant. Tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would, please, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe what you believe. Um, yeah, no religion in my early childhood due to uh, basically a broken situation, domestic violence, alcohol, sex, drugs, the whole thing, you know, pretty crazy, uh, unstable situation. So there was really no time to speak of it, to be honest with you. It, it just wasn't a part of anything, you know. When you're in situations like that, you're literally playing roles. I mean, when you walk in a door, you're like, how is how is the situation today? Is it going to be, hey, am I going to be able to go and maybe get a little bit of eat, uh, do some homework, try to try to go to sleep? Or is it going to be a uh, crazy town? You know what I mean? So there's really nothing but anger and violence. And once again, when you're a child and you have no direction at all and the people you're supposed to trust are literally lunatics, it's it's you're just trying to get out of the situation. So can you just talk a little bit about your conversion story, if you would, please? Well, I came to it through Paul, the man who was killing Christians, and then all of a sudden he's preaching to the Gentiles. So I was turned on to the fact that there's someone who was crucifying the beloved, and and then all of a sudden you know, Jesus said, hey, I got some news for you. Guess what, brother? Hey, you want to you wanna see what I got in store for you? Yeah, you want to you want to see, brother? Remember, remember Stephen? You remember that, brother? Wait till you see what you're going to have to do. So yeah, that impressed me that uh, Paul was, you know, obviously he was a believer in God. Not saying that he was an atheist and didn't have any beliefs and was just killing Christians because you know he had a bad day. But with that being said, you know, that's what started me on the path, and then it just grew from there. Can you walk me through the process of finding Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, giving your life to him, and then finding a place to publicly worship? Because when I converted from atheism to monotheism, my first impulse was not to find the one true religion. My first impulse was to find a place of worship where I could publicly worship my God. Um, I don't seek a church. I'm not out looking for a church to guide me. I have a relationship with my master and that's my relationship with him. I don't. Oh, you never had that impulse to do public worship? Absolutely not. Oh, okay, okay. How long has it been since your conversion, would you say? Well, I mean, you call it conversion. I, I call it seeing the light. I don't think I really converted from anything. I went from being a, an ignorant fool to seeing, oh my God, look at all the, the lies and all the nonsense that Satan has pulled the wools over so many eyes here at this present day with all of this technology. Do you feel confident that you have a direct connection with God such that you can interpret Scripture reliably, or do you ever have any conflict with other Christians over the interpretation of Scripture, or is that a minor concern for you? Well, I mean, I view it, I mean, you're, you're Catholic, obviously, you belong to a church, and you know, I, I get that. I get that being part of a community. I, I get that belonging. Now, some people need that, some people don't. I just happen to be one that doesn't. I worship my master and he knows my heart. And when it comes my time, I get a chance to debate my master and, and go over everything I've done. So how long have you been a Catholic, if you don't mind me asking? Nine years. Are you taught in the Apocalypse of John? That's part of the canon of Scripture, yeah, the Apocalypse. Does your church teach about the Harpazo, the Rapture, the Gathering? There's so many different terms for it. Yeah, we are in the end times since Christ came. And at the end of time, the second coming will occur, Jesus Christ will come, and the living and the dead will be sorted out for the general judgment. Okay. God has a history of sparing his beloved, um, you know, before the flood. You know, everyone died who believed in God. He spared them. So everyone that believed in God actually died before the flood. So can you imagine all those funerals? And, and then Noah and Methuselah out there preaching 120 years. Can you just imagine? And they're going out there and they, hey, we just buried all these folks here and you're still not getting on board with God? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Noah is one of my favorite patriarchs. And the story of Noah's Ark I take very seriously. And it's one of the most powerful images for me. And this is, for me, a reality today. We still have... A flood coming, it's not a flood of water because God promised that he won't give a flood of water. But I think there's a flood coming, a flood of fire, a flood of God's wrath. And we need to get into Noah's Ark. But for me, Noah's Ark is the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And for you, it's probably just a personal relationship with your master, right? 
the, the creator is the master. He's the master of all, the one and only, the living God, the God of the living. So when I say the, my master, it's just my personal relationship with my master. And, you know, and, and let me ask you this. Have you ever watched Logan's Run? No. A movie in 1976 starring Michael York and Jenny Agutter. The premise it was it was the 23rd century. They all lived under a dome. When you turn 30, you got to go and turn yourself into carousel. They blow you up and they make you believe that you're regenerating into the new little test tube babies down below. So the, you know, the, the terms of the people who ran and bucked the system were called runners. So that's where the flat earth runner came from. Just to pop that in real quick. Did he see that and see the hand and the crystal and, and say, Hey man, I know what that, I know what that means. No, I didn't. I didn't know, but thanks for telling and me. Hold on a, a, a quick shout out to Jenny Agutter. Uh, she's my first boyhood crush. If she ever listens to this, you're beautiful, Jenny. And that scene where you jumped into the, the river and the skinny dipping that caused me to spill more seed than Michael J. Fox at a chicken farm. <laughs> well, you know, the Catholic Church is pretty strict about masturbation, sex outside of marriage, abortion, contraception, divorce. Uh, they're all connected issues having to do with the family. Uh, but it's a sensitive set of issues. So if you feel like talking about sexuality, go ahead. If it's too uncomfortable, you don't have to talk about it from your Christian perspective. I mean, wow. I mean, that's that's a tough one. You know, and it's really hard to answer that honestly because sex is sin. And yeah, you just spit out all those rules, uh, you know, that that church handed you. I mean, don't you feel like you have two masters? No. You know? Christ and the church are one, as Paul said. So how do you feel? I mean, why did you go Catholic when it was your time? It's like, you know what, Diama, did you just go around like shop churches? Is that why you were asking me all that? You were like, hey, let me go check out the Lutherans and... Hey, let me see what the, these guys got going on. And you just kind of felt to where you wanted to go. No, no, it had nothing to do with that. It was all about infallibility because God is infallible. And so we need a sure way to have access to the saving truths of the infallible God. And so there has to be an infallible teaching authority where we can resolve different opinions about what scripture might mean. And we need to know what scripture is in the first place, which books belong to the Bible. We don't even know without an authoritative teaching body that can tell us this book is in, this book is out, this one's inerrant and that one's not, and so on and so forth. So we don't even know what the canon of scripture is without the church. And the church is, I think you'll agree, the pillar and ground of the truth, right? Well, I disagree with all of that, but hey, I'm happy that you feel that way. But St. Paul says in the Bible, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, no? Yeah, I know. I, I, I just meant what you said. I mean, I... Where is the church? Well, let me ask you this. Have you read the book of uh, Yasher, the book of the upright? Have you read the book of Enoch? No. You sound like a very intelligent young man. I don't know how old you are. You... 48. You sound like you can you can read through that and let the Holy Spirit in you take over. But uh, I, I'm going to recommend if you can just write this one book down to read, just this one book, and only because you're a Noah fan. It's chapter 106 of the book of Enoch. It's called Fragments of Noah. And they, they tell the story of when Noah, Noah was born. Noah was born, and he was of the angels. He was skin was white, rosy red. His eyes lit up the whole room. When he came out of the womb, he directly spoke with God in the hand of the midwife. If you read this chapter 106, you're going to see that Lamech, went to his dad, who was Methuselah, and he wanted to go, hey, let's go see Enoch. So Lamech, Methuselah, they all ran to go get Enoch. And they said, Enoch, yeah, yeah, God's going to do a different thing with Noah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Noah didn't marry till he was 500. God started the gene pool over with him. Adam was the perfect man. Noah was perfect with God. So he knew that, man, we're going to be down to eight, so we're going to need perfect genes. So Noah's marrying his aunt, and once again, they got some good genes, three strong sons. And see, when I first read that for the first time, when I read the, um, the fragments of Noah, and like I said, I've read it many times, I came to where I'm at now because of the book of Revelation. I went through Revelation probably about 100 times in a span of, I mean, I was, I was obsessed with Revelation because I, I love a mystery, and I was trying to figure out God's mystery. So... I don't know if you've heard of the September 23rd, 2017 sign. Were you familiar with that? No. 
Okay, so in September 23rd, it's Revelation 12. If you look it up, there's a bunch of videos on it. I, I, I learned of that in 2011 and 2012. So when I started diving into Revelation and, and knowing that signs coming up, thinking, okay, is that mid-trib because the witnesses come down, preach for 1260 days after that. If it's a pre-trib rapture, it's going to be right around 2000. This, you know, because you know, mid-trib, you know, it's going to be 1260 days before. So I was trying to figure out, hey, when is this rapture going to happen? How much time? And and I and I downloaded the Solarium free software and I started looking and I wanted to verify and. As I started going back thousands of years, I noticed that the constellations never change, ever. The constellations never change, and that's simply impossible. If you do a small experiment at home and you just take a little four wall and you put the sun right in the middle and you turn your back like, you know, that's the sun, we would see different constellations every quarter. You know, six months later, we're going to be on the other side of the sun looking out into a completely different set of constellations. See, I I looked because I wanted to see if that sign, that September 23rd sign, if you look at Revelation 12, if it, so I went back to 4 BC. And so going back all those thousands of years saying, wait a second, how, if we're traveling 600,000 miles, if the sun's blowing through, you know, if we're, if we're we're blowing through all that fast, we're, we're getting the same view over and over. Over and over, the view has never changed. So that that brought me to the whole. All right, where where are we really living? Where, where what's going on? All right, what's up? So I did a you know that was that 2011, but it made sense now because see, when Methuselah Lamech went to see Enoch, Enoch had already been raptured. He actually came back to talk to Methuselah. And when Enoch went to be raptured with God, he went to the boulders of ice, which they didn't have a word for glaciers. They went out to the circle. So have you never, are you not versed in the flat earth theory? I know that they think there's a ice rim around the perimeter. And that doesn't the least bit, not even curious one bit. If it is true, why would it matter for your eternal salvation? No, it matters just for the fact that Satan is running this world, and it's, Satan is the father of all lies. We we look at lies daily, and we really have to sit and use our own discernment. And then you see basically every movement, whether it's you know labeled conspiracy theory, truth movement, whatever they want to call it, all of the movements are basically controlled by controlled opposition, the government, and they're all people that basically... We'll show you a little bit of truth and just try to, once again, keep a lid on it. But let me ask you this. Are you familiar with the Malachi prophecies? No. Uh, he predicted all the popes, and the last pope was Petrus Romanus, which was the seat of Peter. Uh, he's going to be, uh, you know, so I, I was just saying that that might be something you want to check out. It's the prophecy of St. Malachi. It has to do with the pope. Do you think the Catholic Church is the horror of Babylon, as some Christians think? Well, buddy, I mean, just to give you a quick little two-minute recap, in 1929, the Papal States, if you go take a look at the Book of Revelation, the eighth king right now, they're sitting on Francis. He's the eighth king. And it's the seven of the eight, so guess what? Seven's still alive, which also fits into end times prophecy. And, you know, the city of the seven hills, I mean, we can go on for a long time on that, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things to where... They could definitely be the horror of Babylon, you know, with the purple, the beautiful purple and the jewelry. I mean, and if you go take a look at the money of the European Union, they have the the chick riding on the beast. So, you know, there's a lot of lot of evidence pointing a lot of different directions. But like I said, we'll find out soon enough, brother. I think it's going to be here sooner than we think. Yeah, it always is. Yeah. Why are people drawn to sully the innocence of a very young person? Why is there so much pedophilia? I mean, just look, I mean, you just see the United States legalized gay marriage. So I'm not calling that pedophilia, but that's where it begins. Just think of, you know, Sodom. Think of how bad it was to where two new guys come in and they're about to tear the house down to get to them. So they probably legalized gay marriage and then that's about how bad it got. Is anybody walking into the town? We're going to get a piece of that. So I don't know what drives that. It has to just be pure evil. That's the only thing it can be. I, I, I can't fathom that. No, I'm not talking about a 19-year-old guy that's dating a 17-year-old girlfriend. I'm not talking about that crap. 
you know, I'm talking about the the hardcore, you know, they need to be taken back and, and never seen again. Have you experienced other people seeing the light the way that you came to see the light as an adult? Have you experienced that in other people, this sort of what I would call a conversion experience or no? It's really tough. There's not a lot of people willing to even talk about our, our master. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but uh, if you just go out on the street and start talking to people, you're going to get the cold shoulder. You'll talk to one out of a hundred. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about two people that already know they have a set of values and they're going to go and make have a discussion. I'm talking about going out there, standing, and just trying to talk to people about Jesus. Absolutely not. Now, people in my personal life, as I explained to you earlier, I grew up in a really difficult situation to where don't have really a lot of that. And, you know, these days, you know, you know how it is when you get older, you don't make a lot of friends. So that's just the way life goes. So I don't have a lot of personal experience with people coming to the Lord. And let me ask you this, since you, uh, you may have a different take. So do you believe that you're going to have freedom of choice when you get to heaven? Yeah, every perfection will participate in, yeah. When our Lord tells you to do something, you're going to do it, correct? Yeah, I'm striving to do that even now. I just, I guess I'm just trying to figure out why you think you have free will. You're going to serve the Lord. You're going to be a servant the rest of your life. Yeah, that's freedom. Being a servant to freedom is freedom. God is freedom. Okay, so you believe that you're made in the image of God, correct? Yeah, that means reason and free will, yes. Okay, and do you believe that you're going to be able to get angry in heaven? No. Okay, God gets angry. No, he doesn't. So when he was telling the Israel to wipe all those folks out, he, he wasn't angry? He's not subject to any passion, including anger. There's a literary technique that's being employed in the Bible called attribution or condescension. Those are two words for the same technique, which is basically phrasing things in a way that we can understand it because we are finite creatures, but expressing things that are beyond comprehension. So we have to be careful interpreting the Bible. I believe that we're going to go serve, and I, I don't believe we'll have free will. I don't, I don't believe that uh, I'll be able to just go off and do whatever I want. No, you'll be always doing what you want to do, but what you want to do will be what God wants you to do. There's a strong emphasis in the Catholic Church on the saints. Can you just talk about some of your favorites and why, why you draw inspiration from them? Well, there's, there's so many. I mean, I, I spoke of Stephen earlier. And that, that's going to make me ask you a question. So, you know, I, I told you about my upbringing, you know, when my time comes, if I was in that situation, I would hope that I would have the strength to do what he did. What about you? Would you be going down swinging or would you, uh, you just sit there and take it and pray for him? I get impatient even with mild inconvenience in my day-to-day -day life, never mind having a bunch of people stoning me to death when all I'm doing is proclaiming the truth. But um, to answer your question, I don't think that I have the strength to do it. But if I'm able to submit and to give my life to God, then he'll give me the strength I need. I've taken a lot of beatings in my day. And it, you know, it really impressed me when he was sitting there praying for these guys, when I'd be grabbing them and I'd be going down and I'd be taking a couple with me. Just because I'm Old Testament eye for an eye kind of thing, you know. You know, that's the kicker, Old Testament eye for an eye, and then what's he do? He comes down here, and he shows us it's going to be even tougher than that. Can you imagine never even thinking, never even lusting after all the beautiful women? Can you imagine? So when we get up to heaven, you know, there's no sex in heaven, so it's, you know. But heaven is not less, it's more. It's always more. So we'll have a pleasure that's higher in heaven. So I think you're wrong to look at heaven as a step down in terms of sexual pleasure or in terms of any other pleasure. The danger we fall into when we start thinking about heaven is selfishness and indulgence, self-indulgence, right? We don't want to start thinking, what's in it for me? The gifts are wonderful. The gifts even here below are wonderful, like sex and food and everything else that we take pleasure in here below. Every good gift is from God, but we need to use that gift not as an end in itself, but as a means to looking toward the gift giver and saying, you gave me all these gifts, you gave me myself, my very life, my health, my beauty, whatever I have that's good, you gave me. That's the point of all these gifts here below, is to point 
to the gift giver. And then we in turn have to give our lives back to God because he gave our lives to us. And Jesus in a special way gave his life in a very dramatic and painful way for our sins. So we need to give our lives to Jesus and we need to suffer patiently and we need to be ready to die for Jesus. And of course we can never match his passion and suffering and death, but those little crosses that do come to us, we have to try to accept them with patience. And I think this is this is the main challenge that we face is learning to renounce ourselves and to give ourselves to God because he gave us our lives. Are you able to be certain that you are saved or is there some doubt that maybe you will end up in hell? Well, I mean, I have a personal relationship. He knows my heart. He knows that I believe in everything he's ever done. Now, if he's going to punish me, you know, for things that I do and say, then I'm ready to debate. I'm ready. I'm ready for my date with my master. I have a lot to say. What about you? I am not guaranteed salvation. I need to humble myself. Jesus Christ must increase and I must decrease. So that's my moment to moment mission to accept the grace of God and try to take advantage of the grace of God that he's given me, these gifts that he's given me, the gift of faith, the gift of hope and the gift of love. I need to strive to correspond with the good gifts that God has given me. And if I don't, uh, there's a very real danger of burning in hell for all eternity. It's it's very, very scary. But I'm not worried about it. Why? Because Not because I trust myself, but because I trust God. I trust that God is able to help me because I love him. He's able to help me to detach from my own selfish desires, my own stupidity, and my own ignorance, and to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this life so that I can be happy with him forever in the next. So I don't have a lot of anxiety, but I do acknowledge that it's possible that I'll end up in hell. So I'm trying to prepare now through prayer and the sacraments. I know you don't believe in the sacraments, but you do believe in prayer. I could think that I'm going to heaven now and that I'm not sinning now, but when my death comes, then all the demons come from my soul and they start recounting all my evil deeds, weakening my faith. And if I don't have the graces to persevere through that, I may turn on God and end up in hell. So that's what I'm aware of. And I pray to God to give me final perseverance so that at the moment of death, especially, I'll be protected. But um, at the end of my interviews, I always ask my guests to give a little closing thought, a nice little message of hope. And I hope you'll bear in mind that a lot of my listeners are atheists. So So you have some atheists listening to you? Yeah, the majority of my listeners are atheists. They're scratching that itch that they can never get rid of, right? (laughs) So what could you say to anyone that might be out there listening now? I understand not believing. I I had a lot of anger I had to sort out. I mean, a lot. So I I get why they're so angry. And I, you know, I, I enjoy, I enjoy talking to them. I mean, hell, you can yell and scream at someone and disagree and still have a good time. It's just the people who really take it too personal. I mean, right now, with this generation that's coming up, it's a, the thin skin generation where, you, you know, buddy, they have 24 hours a day on the phone. They can entertain themselves and never have a critical thought in their entire life. You know, their social skills are going to be in shambles. And the only way they're going to hook up is through sites because no one's going to be able to go out and have a conversation and, and everybody gets their feelings hurt. At least atheists, man, you can say whatever you want. No one's going to be crying like a baby. So I, I, I feel for the generation coming up and all this technology that they're completely distracted with. I mean, there's not going to be a lot of uh, intense discussion from those youngsters when they get older. Do you know who Mary Lou Henner is? No. Okay, she's the girl from Taxi, the redhead. She's one of the probably handful of people in the billions that exist that can remember every day of her life. God's given you a picture. Hey, you see that? You see that Mary Lou Henner? Yeah, you tell, and when she's seven, she'll tell you came in, she had pancakes, toast, and went to school, and, and Johnny pulled her hair. She'll tell you about that. He's given you a glimpse of how you're going to be judged. Every hair on your head is numbered. I mean, the worst case scenario is you burn forever, man. I mean, that's a long time, guys. Is it worth it? 
So he's giving you a glimpse of, hey, man, I don't even remember that stuff. How? Well, you're going to get that brain turned to 100%, and then you're going to go back and account for all that stupidity that you did, and then beg for forgiveness, and then see what happens. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.